we have any public comment from the public? No? Any public comment from the committee? You can now. Yeah, okay, hi. So um, I just wanted to, and I um, had sent some emails and bring this to the attention of the committee just to have in the back of their heads. Um, the MCAP scores went home last week, and um, I am wondering um, how we're feeling about them going home via Backpack Express or them being mailed. And I know in the past, um, in the past couple of years, we've mailed them. I mean, we've sent them home via backpack as a cost savings, I'm assuming. Um, but I did just want to bring to the attention of the committee and you know whoever else that you know in this time where we're not focusing all of our attention on what is on that piece of paper, what the MCAS score is, and we're really striving to make sure that we have kids who understand that they are more than just a score. Um, and we also are focusing on the um, anxiety or well-being of students. I'm wondering if we can look at that again and think about how maybe some kids it's fine they're not opening the scores on the bus or they're not reading the scores, but some kids might be doing that. And I just want us to think about if that's something that is important to us to keep to the parents to make the decision of whether or not to show those scores to uh, fourth graders, um, you know, fifth graders, these are young kids, eight and nine years old, um, or if it is fine to continue to send them home via backpack, just a conversation that I wanted to, to bring up. Okay. Did, did your child open theirs? My child did not open them. She happens to be a rule follower, but I, I know that there are some kids who did open them on the bus and were comparing scores. Um, on the bus they were? Hmm? They were on the bus? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> that's typical. Um, it is. And, and I understand um, that, you know, it was it is a cost saving measure to not have to mail those things home, but I just want us to make sure that we're not mailing them home for the not just that that we're that we're we're okay sending them home in the backpacks with the idea that kids are going to open them up and see, especially with the change in the scoring of the MCAS, that this it, there was a shift in the score. So even if you got scores that typically would have met in the normal range, you might have been below, um, you know, partially right, meeting right. so um, or needs improvement. I just want to continue to keep kids thinking positively about what their job here is. That's it. Well, parents did get the call home looking yep. for it so they could look for it. Correct. Yep. There's a long time between dismissal and home. Oh, well, I, I just was right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I just, it's just yeah. my job to sort of bring those things to everybody's attention. Did you hear complaints from parents though? Nope. I didn't hear any complaints. I just want to make sure that okay. That's why we're, and my other, my other child, who, I got it in the mail. So I got to determine whether or not in that moment I could, I shared it with her or not. Because, who was the group? Oh, okay. Right. Do you know what I'm saying? Like the other school. Okay. The other school yeah. my child's at, I received mm -hmm. that in the mail. Okay. And I liked being able to decide if it was important enough to mm -hmm. share or not. And I like having that decision as a parent. My other child, I didn't feel like I had that decision because right. she was like, these are my scores, can I open them? Yeah. And okay. then I, then that leads us to a whole other conversation about, well, it's just a school, you know, that kind of stuff. So maybe it's not on anyone else's radar. I don't know if it's on anybody else's radar. So I thought I'd bring it. No, thank you. No, I just wanted to make sure you didn't hear complaints. Oh, okay. So, okay, and now we're on to the, no one other, no other public comment down there. No. Good. Okay. So now we're on to the chair's report, and I'm going to take a moment to welcome and acknowledge our high school junior Emily Nash. She's back there. Um, Emily made national news a few weeks ago with her win in the Central Mass Division Three Boys Golf Tournament. Um, and I first and foremost would like to acknowledge and congratulate Emily on her performance on the links as well as her exemplary sportsmanship, character, and grace under pressure. Um, we would also like to make certain to the Lunenburg community that the district fully supports Emily and that the school committee has petitioned the MIAA to make the necessary changes to guarantee that this situation is not repeated in the future. The district recently moved towards an athletic advisory committee in order to ensure that stakeholders around athletics could come together to address 
important matters including Title IX issues in our athletic programs. The district views this committee as essential for the flow of information regarding resources and the needs of the student athlete. We also see it as a way to distribute information about the athletic program, including the need to comply with Title IX. In order to address and respond to questions that have been raised about our Title IX compliance, we are taking the opportunity to do a self-assessment of current programs, students' interests, and abilities. Superintendent Combs, our athletic director, Pete McAuliffe, and the high school, school principal, Brian Spadapino, are working with our legal counsel to complete an assessment and the results will be shared with this committee to help inform our actions going forward. Again, I would like to take a moment to congratulate Emily. So if you can come up here, Emily, we have a little something for you. You have proved that you are going to be a great success in the future. I'm going to let the chair present this to you. This is for you. And you have handled yourself so maturely. And we appreciate it as a school. Thank you, ma'am. You're a great representative. Compete and the girls for congratulations <laughs> thank you again thank Emily. You. Emily would you like to introduce your parents and your yeah. brother <laughs> <laughs> I think they helped out with I, I think so that's my mom Terry, <laughs> and my dad Bob and my brother Robbie <laughs> And Emily being the humble uh, champion that she is, um, I just want to let the uh, community and the rest of the committee know uh, that tomorrow she'll be honored by the MIAA and recognized um, uh, in front of about 1,400 student athlete ambassadors at Gillette Stadium. Um, and I know that uh, that'll be a, a special moment for her. And then she's off to Florida for a golf tournament. So, uh, <laughs> Good luck with both of those. Is that going to be on the golf channel? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a AJGA, which is American Junior Golf Association okay. Invitational Tournament. So I just got invited last week, I think. That's so awesome. Yes. Excellent. Well, good luck with that. Good job. Good Enjoy. Good Enjoy. Excellent. Is it going to be warm weather down there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Warmer than here. <laughs> And we know there's a lot going on and a lot of homework perhaps waiting for you. So whenever uh, you need to slip out, please do so. And thank you again yeah, for thank being you here. Yes, and Emily, thank you, thank you uh, for bringing such pride um, to our community. Mm -hmm. So now to the chair report. I mean the superintendent's report. Do you want to do the warrants? And oh, we have to do the first? warrants, yes. Yeah. Um, so the warrants are on the table oh, for signature. Um, the way down there, I, yeah, I yeah. adopt the press. Okay, do we have line item transfer? Uh, we do have some Thank line item. Thank, Thank, Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Take care. Uh, we do have a uh, line item transfer. This is um, uh, uh, one of those transfers that we do every fall. It's taken the, uh, we're pretty far into the fall, but uh, as you know, we had a switch over uh, of retirement in our business office, and uh, Mr. Cassidy is here to present this. Um, so do you want to talk about this line item transfer, Mr. Sure. Cassidy? Good evening, everyone. Uh, what you have in front of you is a proposed transfer I think it's in your packets over um, here. It should be. It's definitely here. Okay. Yeah, got it. So the, the proverbial hiring dust has settled, and uh, we've got we've got people in 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 the accounts that they need to be in. Uh, as soon as I started in the district about five and a half about five weeks ago, I launched into reviewing uh, the personnel uh, line item line item accounts and did an audit to reconcile uh, the, the uh, personnel uh, budget line item accounts, which are right in front of you. So uh, these proposed transfers in front of you will take care of a few things. Uh, it will address some of the transfers and the reassignments that happened over the summer. And when that happens, that that's basically a different salary hitting different uh, line items and different accounts. Which will uh, which will affect uh, overages and deficits. Uh, we're, we're also taking a look at uh, allocating salaries properly. So um, 
part of, part of my salary is the HR director and also the business manager. So uh, we're uh, appropriating some of those accounts. Our ELL teachers are going to be pulled out of the, the account that they've been uh, hitting over the last couple of years. So we can appropriately uh, address uh, or account for those funds on our state level uh, reports. Um, and then some of these uh, some of these transfers addressing some underfunded accounts as, as we moved into the, the school year. So my notes are very vague. Uh, I, I, it's not intentional or trying to uh, trying to do anything sneaky. It's uh, we're trying to get all the transfers on one page. But I would I, I would like to uh, open uh, open the discussion up to any questions that you might have on any specific transfers that are in front of you. Um, what is, let's see, it's the one, two, three, four, fifth one down, um, it's talking about the increase reflects Title I reduction, 50% local funds for positions. What is that? Do we get less Title I funds this year? So when the budget is developed, uh, we really don't know what some of our federal funding uh, uh, entitlements will be. Our Title I uh, budget was re reduced, and uh, we, um, um, to, to accommodate for that reduction, we uh, have one employee funded locally, uh, half locally, and ha one half uh, through the grant. Mm -hmm. um, so. At the time of the budget, we didn't know that, so we're trying to uh, to get local funds into the specific account to cover that. Okay. Also, okay. Can, can I just say, I, I, you have another question, that 109 is not the 50%. The, the what we're also do, doing is moving uh, so it's um, it's an ELL teacher and uh, two ELL teachers. Okay. So one uh, one is funded locally, and one is funded uh, half locally and half Title One. So that's that's the whole one. that's the hundred nine thousand. It's not it's not one one uh, position. Okay. So when the reduction in that line below it moved ELL teacher to new account, that would be the new account. Yes. Okay. Question third, um, third item from the bottom. What um, what precipitated that change? That's a significant change. Are, are you speaking of the yeah. special ed uh, transportation? No, the athletic director. Athletic director. From the bottom. Third, athletic third from the bottom. The bottom. Athletic director. Oh, the athletic director. Mm -hmm. um, Foxy, did you want to talk about the history of the creation of that position? Um, in, in from, from my understanding is that uh, we created a, a, an athletic director position and we're allocating it. so it's half of well, the Well I think the coaches, it, it, that's not just the athletic director, that must be the uh, coaches and athletic director. Oh, the, the total line? The yeah. Total it, line. Yes, it, yes. yes, it's the coaches and the athletic oh. director. Okay. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I thought you were... You yeah. were no, I... I, I, I it made it like a one mission which... I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, and, and um, I... That just shows the allocation of the salary there, but that is coaches that are also in that. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, there's no, there a significant change in it, so I and yeah, I'm thinking I, uh, it was one position it yeah, made me Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want that job. I have a question about one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, seven and eight, the middle school principal assistant principal and the high school principal assistant principal do both, um, they both say that the increase reflects the dean of students allocation. Yes. So in that sort of high, middle school principal slash assistant principal, then slash dean of students would be included in that? So th that bears some uh, some uh, explanation. So at the at the middle school level, what we've uh, we do have a dean of students, which is a teacher, right? Yep. Who gets it does get a stipend? Correct. And um, she does have a, uh, a reduction in her teaching uh, schedule. Yep. So we're applying some of her teaching salary to this account as well to appropriately charge her duties and represent it. For our reporting purposes. Okay. So it's the five thousand. It's uh, it's approximately twenty six thousand of her teaching salary, which is what we're putting into that account. Um, and then there's also there's an adjustment for the the assistant principal. Okay. For the salary. But and what about the high school? Then what about yeah? What about the high so school? So the high school. Uh, these are good questions. Uh, the, Thank you. Uh, so getting back to the athletic uh, director, so okay. half of his salary you'll see is reflected in the um, um, the coaching account. And the other half, he'll, he is the dean of students for the high school. We are appropriating his uh, half of his salary to that right. account as well. So okay, but more than that stipended, okay. It's half of his salary, yes. Okay. There's no stipend yep. associated with that account. Half of dean, okay. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. So each of those lines ended up having the principal, the half assistant principal, the assistant principal is our split, and then like and all then of the deans uh, are um, the AD is high school dean, and uh, then we have the middle school dean. Okay, I just I figured that. Um, it would make sense if there was like so slash dean is also added to that line, which totally makes sense to me. I just didn't catch it yep. when we went through. So the okay. high school dean of students, what is it half time? Yeah, I know who it is. It's a half time. Is he spending half of his time as dean of students? I think that's that's how we put it here, and they're collecting that information to make sure that it will be adequately. Uh, represented, you know, that's uh, that's kind of how we proposed it, um, and said half dean, half ad. Okay. Um, and so I've asked the Mr. McAuliffe as well as uh, Principal Spadafino to basically track that. Okay. So as we do the next budget developments, we have clear indications of how, what that allocation is in in reality. Yeah, okay. we have it in theory, but is that matching reality? And, and I think you need to see that over the course of the year because I think uh, there's the um, the different seasons oh, place different um, demands um, on the AD. So yep. that's why we'll track it over time. And by the end of this first year, I think we should have a better idea of what what that um, allocation actually is. And I think that uh, Superintendent Combs, you had said that we would get that report of that new position. Um, when Mr. Spadafino came to give right. us his budget anyway, so he can give us some oh, that's in, input on mm -hmm. you know how that new position is going and how it compares to the middle school. I don't know if he can tell you how it compares to the middle school, but um, Mr. S uh, Sanford will be here and talk about that dean position right. as and well. Right, and then we can make the comparison. Right, <laughs> there you go. Leave it to us. But, Dean of students in two different buildings with two different age groups could predicate completely different responsibilities. responsibilities. So I would think it's, it's looking at it each individual position right. and the breakdown of their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And how they're managing them. Yes. Um, I did have one. We have uh, 
four different light ends for the overtime of custodians. They were underfunded expenses, so we didn't have anything in the past for them. And uh, I'm not sure how to word my question. Um, why do we have overtime for? Why do they need to have overtime? They aren't able to accomplish what they need during that. Oh, the custodians. Yeah. Can we rent out the building? Annually, there uh, th th there is a, there's a small pocket of money that's used to cover overtime, so it it, it could be for uh, snowstorms. That's okay. that's generally the uh, okay. uh, from what I've seen in uh, doing my research, mm -hmm. okay. uh, and, and then just covering uh, from the end out if if there's if someone is out it has to be called in, or okay. if there's or if there's just a, a general building issue and, and we need a response. Okay, that makes sense. Um, one, one of the interesting things about having new eyes on the budget mm -hmm. is, I, I look back because I was surprised by this, because when we have our actuals at the end of the year, we always have overtime showing <coughs> and being expended out of those lines for the reasons that Mr. Cassidy uh, talked about. And yet, when we're budgeting, we've never budgeted the overtime into those lines. Mm -hmm. And so something that regularly occurs. Right, exactly. Um, so uh, when we, when we investigated that, it was sort of like, well, why have we done that? So Mr. Cassidy has relied on um, past history as well as some projections just based upon uh, some of the changes that we've seen even since the first of, of the fiscal year, July 1. Mm -hmm. We've had some changes that have required um, some um, some overtime for folks because we've been uh, short on staff for okay. a variety of okay. reasons. Um, this paraprofessional, high school paraprofessional, says increased supports for, for student advisory. What student advisory, just the advisory? It's the advisory. Uh, since the inception of advisory, um, there's been uh, a someone assigned to cover advisory, mm -hmm. uh, to cover studies, so teachers can do advisory. Okay, and in order to do that, they've been hiring temporary personnel in for several years now, um, and those positions were finally listed into the budget. So they <coughs> had substitutes, basically, that have worked uh, throughout that time period. Um, sometimes I think it was the nature of who was doing the substituting because we had um, a former coach who came in regularly, um, regularly would be every day, all day long, um, to do those studies for the, uh, to cover the studies so the teachers would have the time available to do uh, the advisories. Um, and now the, that's placed into the budget before they were showing up in substitute lines. And why so they only one period a day? It is, but to re have the uh, teachers be able to do the advisories, the cost of that is, is basically having these folks full time every day. Mr. Spadafino can go through okay. Okay. the mystery of the high school um, advisory. <laughs> well, not so much advisory, but just how the interplay with how the um, schedule works. Okay. The, the, that's right. how it plays uh, in terms of de relieving teachers from that particular duty in order for them that, then to do advisory okay. twice a week. And he'll be here next week. Yeah. Keep up. Yep. yep. So that's my last. Okay. Mm -hmm. You guys good? Good. Anybody, Jim? Got anything? Everything's been asked that I had. Okay. Very good. Okay. All right. So, 
So none of these changes the bottom line in terms right. of the budget. No. Is right, still right, budget. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it does make explicit uh, how the dollars are being ex right. uh, expended and puts them in the DESE funding codes appropriately as well, yeah. correct? Okay. It'll help us move forward setting next year's budget okay. uh, in the next month or so. I can't believe that. Uh, so the, the, the line items will be uh, more in sync. Uh, when we present it to Okay. So I added the slash dean um, on this. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, so we, yeah. Right. Um, you can take a vote, um, but everyone still needs to sign off on this. Uh, right, right. On okay. how you want to do that. So, and I also put um, AD and our <coughs> okay. line because that <laughs> number does include that, as we pointed out. So I wrote in those changes on that particular Okay, form. so I'll take a motion to approve them, and then we all have to sign it. I make a motion that we approve the line item transfers as requested. I'll okay. take second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, and I'm going to pass this down. Thank you. And then we have minutes. Uh, we have one other. Oh, we have, um, oh, that. We have the year in annual year in report for FY17 uh, that was uh, prepared by Ms. Cooper, uh, working in conjunction with uh, Karen Brochu, the town financial director. Um, and this um, has a lot of backup. I did not haul the notebook over um, uh, tonight. Um, yes, it is literally that. Uh, big and this is what the auditor comes in and um, and does the audit review on um, but I have signed off of it as of October 31st um, the ta uh, school committee chair um, is also required to sign mm -hmm. and so I had uh, passed out this document to you at the last meeting so you'd have some time to review it we provided the schedule 19 <coughs> Back up from the town that Ms. Brochu um, provided last week, um, and at this point in time, I'm um, asking if you will authorize the school committee chair and recommending that you authorize the school committee chair to sign off on this report. As reflecting our motion, motion. Right. 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 I make a motion that we authorize. I, I did have a question. Oh, there are okay. a couple of spots on here where we're supposed to check one or the other, and neither are checked. Okay. Um, is it required that thirds are checked? I would assume if it needs a check, it should be checked off. <coughs> so, what page is that? Pages? Unfortunately, the page, page numbering is not very good, but schedule two, I know. Page, three page three of three. Schedule two of three. I didn't have that open. Twelve. Page twelve in. Is it just because our. Well, this asks for an assessment method used for fiscal year 17. Is that true? Oh, there's more than one. There are more than one. Oh, yeah. check one. Yeah, there's more Do than one on here. Do these need assessment mm -hmm. methods? Mm -hmm. Is that on schedule two? Yeah. It, it doesn't apply because we're not a regional uh, school district. That's, that's the only. If we're. If, if you were a board of a regional school district, we would have to assign that for regional. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 because we share. Oh, we would share. Okay. All right. And then um, from the back, I guess. From the back. The fourth page from the end. Mm -hmm. And back. the. That, that checkbox again, Mr. Lovett? Yeah, there's another. The, um, did your district use appropriate administrative cost average? Yes or no? We used actuals, not per pupil. Okay. So it's a no. check off now. That's what's checked. Yep. Oh, is yours checked off? Right here it is. Oh, okay. Oh, so there's, so there's that's what I said. Okay. Hers is checked off. So the copy that you just, just got off of is the details. And I could swore I had another no, one. Um, oh. And that's retail, so that one doesn't matter. Okay. That was the only question I had. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
Oh wait, no, I should make a motion. I, I know, but I forgot my wording. Okay. <laughs> I make a motion that we authorize the school committee chair to sign this. And a year certified. And a year certified statement. Second. All. Okay, then we have the minutes to approve. Did you guys look at the minutes? Yes. Yes. Did you have any comments? No? No for me. So I'll take a motion to approve the November 1st meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the regular session minutes November 1st. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Superintendent Seymour. Yes, I just wanted to um, remind everybody um, if we get out of here soon enough, <laughs> we're going to go for the wrap there. Um, but um, I also wanted to uh, let everyone know that on Monday evening at 6 o'clock is the National Honor Society induction program. I believe we have 40. Uh, students that are being inducted and we'd invite you all to join us uh, here at 6 p.m. in the auditorium. It's always a beautiful ceremony. Um, it's one of the highlights of the year. So if you have uh, time, come out that evening and join us. Our congratulations to all the students who are going to be inducted. Congratulations to everyone for completing the first quarter of the school year. It seems uh, interesting to be already at that point. The, the first 45 days have flown by, certainly. Um, I think we're having lots of banquets and celebrations around the end of uh, a very productive and exciting fall sports season. And uh, everybody's getting ready for these next months of really focusing on the studies and and uh, all the activities that are coming up. I know sign-ups are going on right now. And I should stop now so our students yeah. can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, But um, just really appreciate everything that um, folks have done with <coughs> the parents that came, to, that came out for parent <coughs> conferences. I just want to once again remind parents that anytime they feel they need a conference with a teacher, they just need to reach out to the teacher and, and set those up that uh, the partnership between parents and the schools um, is critical to successful student learning. So we welcome that opportunity at any time. That's it. Short and sweet. Good. So maybe go to the uh, Alan Savoy, and do you have a report for us? Yes. Um, so as Superintendent Combs was saying, we have successfully completed the first term and transitioned into the second. <laughs> um, we've wrapped up all fall sports except for the last football Thanksgiving game, which will be on Wednesday at 6 p.m. versus Quabbin. Um, so yeah, we've finished all the fall crazy homecoming um, hustle and bustle, but student council and the school itself is still really busy um, with a bunch of different activities. Um, so next week we have Thanksgiving break with an early release on Wednesday. Um, on Tuesday we're going to have the powder puff game. It was rescheduled. It was supposed to be tonight. Um, so we have the student council versus faculty game at 6 p.m. and the juniors versus seniors game at 7 p.m. And then admissions, um, I believe it's three dollars and then you're also required a can good to um, raise the food for the Thanksgiving baskets. Um, in addition, the class of 2019 is still continuing their clothes drive that started November 1st and then goes until December 5th. And that, so I just want to extend a thank you to the community because that has been going beyond imagine. Um, we already have an entire room in the TCP filled, the, the whole floor. Um, we're getting calls every single day from all three of the schools saying that they have loads and loads of clothes that need to be picked up. So it's awesome that we're able to do such a good fundraiser that will raise money for the class as well as raise um, money and collect a bunch of clothes for the, ep um, the Epilepsy Foundation. Um, and then also the Student Council is participating in, the Lunab in Lunenburg's 10th Annual Gift Mart. Um, it's held in mid-December um, through the Lunenburg Food Pantry, the high 
or the all the Lindenberg schools and the local churches. So we're asking for help by sending unwrapped gifts for children and adults to schools by December 4th. And then boxes will be collected at all three of the schools. Um, Superintendent Combs mentioned the NHS induction. Again, that will be on Monday night. And then lastly, the Christmas tree lighting will be held November 30th at the gazebo. At the gazebo. It's held by the Student Council, and it's a great way for the community to come together. Um, and then I also wanted to thank um, the community and the school committee for their help with my Coloring for Cancer project. We've um, finished collecting all of our donations and we're very successful with that. I want to thank the Lions Club and also just members of the community for donating not only coloring supplies but also making donations towards our um, funds to actually print the books. So hopefully the books and everything will be distributed as predicted in during the holidays. So thank you. Uh, what time is the tree lighting there when you do? Uh, I think at six. 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 Are you having hot cocoa? Yeah. Yes. The, the student council provides all the snacks. And yeah. Where at TCP? No. no, it's gonna be right at the gazebo. Oh, at the gazebo. Yeah. Okay. 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 Go to the third reading of our five one oh four five point oh four school calendar policy. Have we had any comments? We've not received any feedback. Nothing? Because it's not great. So, it, would we accept it today or would we wait till the next one? You can approve it. We can approve it today. I will take a motion to approve oh, the well, calendar. Well, I make a motion that we approve um, thir the policy 5105.04, the school calendar. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, new business. Uh, initial approval of school council convention 2018. Is that Ms. Garrett? Thank you for having me. John Garrett, um, student council advisor at the high school. Uh, in the past, we've been able to go to the Massachusetts State Conference for student council. And in the last couple of years, we haven't really taken anybody because uh, of the money issues. And so we've got some interest this year again. Um, enough interest and real interest that I said, all right, I got to come to see you guys and see if I can continue with this process and um, maybe get us signed up and get us to go again. So it's a state conference. It happens uh, in Hyannis on the Cape, March 7th, 8th, and 9th. Um, so questions that Ms. Combs had, um, Superintendent Combs had asked me because I wasn't going to be here because I was going to be at Powder Puff, so I kind of outlined that. So <laughs> some of the issues, some of the, you know, the cost of it is, um, the biggest issue is transportation at this point. Um, and so we have four students that want to go. Um, my junior uh, president, Chris Tobin, the secretary and senior, Sophie Shapiro, she's wanted to go for the last couple of years, but I don't have to pull it off because there hasn't even been enough kids to go with it. Money in the end is a big problem. We have a sophomore, Claire Delaney, and a freshman, Kyle Wise, that wants to go. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So we got a nice little mix yeah. of kids, and so um, that's great. Yeah. And so, so you know, someone like Sophie, who's been trying to go, um, but either there's not enough kids that we can go down, make it worth the trip, uh, or it, you know, typically it's a money issue that brings the kids back to it. So um, how do we get there is a big twist here, and sort of a, an idea um, where there is only four kids. Um, I have a minivan. I have the proper coverage. I typically take it down anyways in the past. Uh, what we've done is sent the kids down on the bus with either Lemonster, um, Oakmont slash North Middlesex has opened their bus to us, but at a cost of like $800 um, to take these kids down. So um, the with four kids going, I said, you know, we can fit this in my minivan. I do have the proper coverage. I'm willing to do it. Uh, I like to have the van down there anyways because the, we stay at the off-site hotel. There's two hotels, one where all the big conference happens. 
The second off-site um, hotel is for the overflow, um, just because there's so many, there's like 1,400 kids, I think, that go down there. 1,400 people, over 1,000 kids that go down there every year. So if I could take the van, the cost of the trip for the kids would be $300. And if we have to put them on the bus, the cost of the trip goes up to like 450. In both cases, the student council is absorbing some of the cost because it's just so important to get these kids down there. Um, I know I feel a difference in the council um, when they come home from this event. The spirit, the ideas, the speakers that we see are just inspiring, and they just with the whole fire and. Um, just a, a different perspective. They get to talk to so many other kids and other councils as well. They go to uh, many conferences, plus we have big giant ones with uh, phenomenal speakers, and it's really a, a great opportunity. And it does, it, it just keeps um, our council fresh with new ideas and, and spirit for sure. Um, so I would love to be able to take it, at least these four kids down. Hopefully they only give them the ticket price. They knew the range of the price. Uh, and the problem is, is it always comes in in December, so it's a tough time. Right. Yeah. 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 Question, does this include most of their meals? Everything. Oh. Everything. Okay. We, we leave um, late morning. We get down there, we stop and have lunch, and then um, we check into the hotel. They have this big, crazy welcome time. They actually do this polar plunge. They do, they do a fundraiser. We haven't done that. It's kind of a, a new thing since we haven't been going, but talking to the NM um, student council advisor, she's like, you got to do it. It's fantastic. It's you know crazy, crazy experience. Um, and then it, it starts right there, and they get all their meals supplied. Uh, and the, the busing from... So if I take my van down there, that would only be for... Um, me and the other adult would be coming. The kids would not go for back and forth um, because they, they have busing for the kids to go from the hotel in the morning. They basically lock them in there for the day and then take them back at like I think okay. at dinner time they can after dinner they can go back and change. They have a dance. They have different events that happen at, at the in the evenings and so they take them back to the hotel and then they would bring them back. So they, I would be taking them in my van beyond just to and from. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, um, so you leave Wednesday morning and come back Friday, Friday. night? Well, no, Friday morning Friday. school time. Oh, yeah. right, the school time. Yeah, okay. they have a, a, a morning meeting at the end of uh, the conference. They announce the state um, positions because the, they, we get to vote for the state, all the kids that run the state council. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty cool process to see the, you know, what we go through. And like I said, the speakers, we've actually brought a few of the speakers back here because um, the, kid the kids thought they were just dynamite. So. And I think the benefits, I mean, that's what kind of already talked about all those, but do you have any questions for me? You mentioned that student council would be making up part of the cost. Do you have an estimate? Uh, if if, if, if we go with the van, I believe it was around 850 and then if we do, with the, we have to take the bus, it's like 1200 we just try to like ballpark a reasonable number that, you know, 300, 450 kind of rounded it and then figured out um, the rest of it. So 300 would be with what the student council absorbed? $300 would be, yeah. Their, so their cost for three days, right. housing, yes. food, transportation, yes. okay. rooms, right. everything. Okay. So when you said that some of the cost was absorbed, but yeah. it was you gave it, us yeah. included the, the portion that, okay. right. that I mean, the, the two costs for the kids yeah. would probably go would be like four twenty-five, four fifty-ish. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. With, that, with, with, with me taking the van down, right. and then if I have to add the cost of that plus the bus, then it would be yeah. five, six hundred dollars. We'd never get to go. So that's why we always, as a council, try to pull it back a little bit, try to, you know, contribute some of the money to it. Um, yeah, no, I think it's good. And I haven't had a speeding ticket in a very, very long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need a motion. Uh, motion to. But wait, would you, Box, do you want to? Um, yeah, right. I, I, I just want to, you know, um, this is a very beneficial opportunity for the students, and I really appreciate Ms. Guerin's willingness uh, to drive down in the van. That still requires the parent permission. Um, yeah. We do have policy that permits mm -hmm. this, and as Ms. Guerin said, it requires some additional coverage um, on their vehicle and the parent permission as well. Um, I wish there were a way that 
this could be fully funded by the district because this is our student leadership and um, and for parents to, and the students to have to absorb even that amount of money um, is um, is concerning, I guess. Um, especially when it means a lot of years we don't have the opportunity right. to take the students. Well, back yeah. in the day when we first, when I first out in, the, in as a student council advisor, I don't know how many years ago now, we used to have the students write a letter of reasons why they needed to go, or they wanted to go, and we'd have to pick from 20 plus letters and choose 12 okay. kids to go. And over the years, it, we just the, the kids just know they, they can't ask their parents. Um, I did ask North Middlesex what they charged the kids, and it was like 4.25 um, to go on the bus. I asked what Oakmont gave because they go together, and she said Oakmont's fully funded. Fully funded. So they take the 12 kids that they're allowed to take fully paid for. Wow. Mm -hmm. so. So my recommendation is that we approve this, um, but um, my other recommendation is that uh, we see if we can look for some additional funding to help yeah. support the students in attending. Um, I'm thinking that la uh, last meeting we received uh, some donations around two other uh, trips, and I'm wondering to myself uh, why we haven't perhaps used some of those funds to help support this particular trip of the high school students because we have elementary going to nature's classroom, we have um, the DC trip for the middle school, um, and perhaps this might be something for us to consider in terms of how those funds get a a allocated going forward in terms of helping with that. Um, I'd also like for us to reach out to organizations in the community and see if, uh, if there's ways that we can, um, we have the Lions Club yeah. to meet, uh, reach out to us at the beginning of the school year saying what are some of the, the needs and this seems like one that uh, perhaps we can reach out to the Lions Club yet again because I know they've been very generous to us um, and um, see if, if there's some assistance that can be given there or we reconsider how we distributed the funds uh, from the uh, Connell Lorenz Foundation uh, to, that was $2,500 mm -hmm. um, donation, I believe, is what it was. Also, perhaps, you know, some of our other local businesses, Walmart and Hanford, mm -hmm. are often generous with us. Walmart does grants. I mean, it, it would require a little research on mm -hmm. our part. Um, be something I would be willing to help with in terms of research, but that might be able to get, you know, even if it can't get fully funded, right. you know, a chunk of it down to make what the school could then put in the rest or even reducing, you know, more what. How many students would we be allowed to bring? Twelve. Twelve in the district? And, and, you know, I think one of the hardest parts, I mean, obviously, ask, the kids asking their parents for money is a huge Difficulty mm -hmm. for the kids. Well, especially um, December. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But they also are missing three days of school, so the kids are really committed that right. want to go to this right. day. They right. know it's painful to miss three days of school. Oh and yeah, they're especially they're, in high school. And these kids, you know, they'll they're go school. off to the dance, yeah. stay for a little bit. And sometimes they're coming back and doing some homework. I mean, they've been down there doing homework uh, at times, and you know, downtime when when other kids might be swimming in the pool and doing yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah. So these kids know oh, yeah. the work that's involved. So we know the financially worst case scenario, if I can refer to it that way, and it could get better. This approval is just for the initial approval to uh, start moving forward with actually engaging the, uh, the students. Um, and um, I think our policy calls for four weeks before the trip to come back for final approval. So uh, we'll all work together to see if we can um, assist with with that, you probably need to make some reservations. Yeah, the dates right? need to yeah. happen a little bit yeah. before. It, it's mid-January that I have to have. Okay. Well, it opens January 1st and closes February 1st, and so I put the mid-January, trying to give parents maybe a little right. bit more time to come up with money if we know. That's when we know. So. Now I'll take a motion. Motion to approve initial. Oh. Um, I want to make sure that I'm abstaining from. Yes, I know. Okay. I figured that. Okay. <laughs> Make a motion um, for initial approval of the Student Council Convention in 2018 with attendance by our students as outlined by. Okay. Second. In favor, all. 
Thank you. 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 Thank
yet we're seeing a huge bump in visits to the health office and that administration. So this is some straightforward data about what goes on in our health offices, but it's all well and good to look at that data, but I don't think, honestly, that that's a good re reflection of everything that we do. I think there's a lot of things that we do in the health offices that aren't obvious. It's not that whole picture. We have a goal in the health services, and that is to have as many students as possible present in school, in the classroom, and ready to learn. We take our goal very seriously. We manage all students' safety, their health and wellness, every day, every student, one at a time. We are definitely seeing an increase in the medical complexity of all these students that we're managing in our district. The numbers of things that we're seeing in our schools today are very different than what we saw even five years ago, let alone if you think back to when we were in school, I hate to say. But the um, complexity of the conditions that we are seeing um, are changing. I'm not going to talk about each one of them. I'm only going to talk about two things on this slide. That's why I highlighted them, so I wouldn't forget the two things I wanted to mention. One of them that I want to mention is that despite all of these conditions and these medical complexities that we're seeing in our students, these students are in the classroom, not in our offices, not at home. We're able to get them here to school and into the classroom. That's a big goal of ours, and I think that we do a great job of accomplishing that. The only other thing I wanted to say about these is that huge rise in the students with mental health issues. Huge rise. And I think that's why you see the bump in health office visits and med administrations despite the bump in enrollment. I think that's one of the big reasons why. The other thing I want to say about that is it's not as straightforward as you might think, although maybe you do. These students don't come walking into the health office and say, oh, I'm here because I am so anxious. I had practice yesterday after school. It was a tough practice because it's a big game. I feel a lot of pressure for that. By the time I got home, I did my homework. I had so much homework. I had a test that I had to study for. It was after midnight by the time I finished all that. And then my phone's lit up with all this drama about the girls talking about this one and that one. And now I'm all worked up and I can barely sleep. And then this morning I come to school and now I have that test next period and I just don't feel... I just don't feel ready. Unfortunately, they don't come through the door and say that. Unfortunately, they come through the door and say, you know what, I just don't feel good. I really have a, I have a stomach ache. I don't know why. I just don't feel good. So those visits are happening on a regular basis, and the nurses are very aware of that. They're aware of what types of questions to have, what conversations to have with students about that. So, oops, jump to slide. What else are we doing that's not an obvious um, thing in the health offices? Um, there's a lot of things that we're doing providing comprehensive care. <laughs> and I'm not going to talk about all the different things that we do, but I am going to talk about one or two things. One of the things I want to mention is this managing the students with concussions. Because again, I think that we, see, we are seeing a very large number of increases in students with concussions. See, we're getting good use of the money of our NASA journals. <laughs> Here's a uh, feature article about concussions. I don't think that we're seeing increased concussions in the health offices because kids are getting concussed more. I think that through all the awareness and education around concussions, they're getting diagnosed more. And that's a good thing. And along with the education that they're learning about concussions, they're learning the importance of how to treat them. And it was, for a while, so important that they had a gradual return to play to get back in the game. But what they've also learned with their education is that it's as important, if not more important, that they have a gradual return to learn in the classroom. And that's what the nurse is doing with each of these students that have diagnosed concussion. They monitor, they communicate with the teachers, the parents, the students, the provider, and make sure that there's an individual plan for each one of those students all throughout their concussion until they're cleared and able to be back in the classroom. And their journals are, are helpful with things like that. Here's a great article about how to help those kids with the return to learn. I mean, these students don't look any different sitting in the classroom, so it's not always apparent to the teacher that there's an issue with a, a student who's in the classroom still having some symptoms from concussion. So it's important that there's somebody that's coordinating that. The only other, other thing I wanted to say about the concussions was I wanted to thank the PTO because, as you are, are probably aware, we were able to um, get the benefits of the um, Cantu Concussion Clinic that had a grant 
that we were not able to qualify for as a school, but through the PTO, because it was nonprofit, we were able to take the benefits of that grant, which provides free baseline screening for as many students as would like to have that. So we were able to coordinate that. <coughs> we had them come two days in October for high school students. They're coming back in, at the end of November to do middle school students, and hopefully we'll be able to coordinate that moving forward each year, depending on how the grant goes. Um, the other thing that school nurses are doing that's maybe not so obvious is managing all the return to school for students that have, that have been out for illness, that they've been out and had mono for 10 days, for instance, or um, an injury, like an injury when you've broken both wrists and you come to school with two casted wrists, um, that requires a little bit of planning. Or any hospitalizations when they've been out, and that includes mental health hospitalizations. When they come back to school, it's the nurse that coordinates that reentry to hopefully make that a better transition. This nurse also attends the 504 meetings for individual students, but they also attend um, the student support meetings. And they're a part of a team that looks at prevention for students on a regular basis. They meet on a regular basis for students that would perhaps be falling through the cracks and under the radar for not being successful. These students that are at risk, whether it be because of attendance or because of their grades. So the nurse is an important part of that team as well. They also attend uh, wellness advisory committee and work closely with that group. They're uh, involved, of course, with emergency preparedness and that also <coughs> includes our AEDs that we have in each one of our schools um, and making sure that there's enough staff in each building that are trained for CPR and use of the AED as well. Also, lastly, they provide classroom teachers with the most um, important in, uh, information to ensure that there's a safe and healthy environment for all. They're that person that provides that information to the teachers. Did I mention our goal? <laughs> <laughs> Students in the classroom and ready to learn. The school nurses in Massachusetts um, are, were able to facilitate a return to class rate of 93.1%, which is excellent. However, Louisville Public Schools nurses return to class rate is 93.6%, which is even better. <laughs> and then the very last thing I want to say is I want to just share that the nurses recognize the unique perspective that we have in a relationship that we have with these students. We're not a provider that they only see once a year for their physical or only when they're sick. We are lucky enough to um, have a long-term relationship with students from kindergarten to graduation where we can have um, continuing conversations with them about making good choices and achieving the ultimate goal, which is lifelong health and fitness. And that's an important goal for us too. Thank you for your attention and your continued support. Any questions? I have a question. So a student comes to the office and they're complaining of that stomach ache that's probably not just a stomach ache, more an anxiety or something. How are the parents notified that a student is coming for a, a short visit where it's not fever or vomiting, that, you know, that's clear to contact the parents, but for things like that, how are the parents notified and then is there guidance follow-up for things like that? Um, I think that that's done on an individual basis depending on the student and how severe or how often those types of visits are happening. Um, again, this is another example of how we try to foster the, in the independence in the student to um, suggest to them that they have conversations with the parent. I mean, when they're going through situations like that, I think it's helpful to help coach them around how to have a conversation with their parent about this. Like, have you shared this with your parent? And if they're not comfortable with that, then I think we would offer to do that along <coughs> with them. Because I think that you don't want to just fix it for them. I think they have to learn how to manage that in conversations with their teachers or with their parents. You know what I mean? We help them, but I don't but we don't do it all for them. Right, I didn't know where your, I don't know, like confidentiality with the, the student relationship with the student, do you then step out to the counselor and say, I think the student is having more than typical anxiety and bring them in on that conversation to, to follow up with it, the student? It would depend on how severe the, the situation was. I mean, we do utilize our resource with our school counselors and our social workers in our schools, for sure. We work together as a team for things like that, yeah. Does that answer that? I think so. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you very you much. much. Mr. Malagrino is here to talk about our technology.
Madison and not the state, or a recommended budget. There are several of them, as, as the case yeah, the may be. <laughs> uh, good evening, and thanks for the opportunity to provide an update on technology uh, and to present a proposed, proposed budget for next fiscal year. I'd like to take a little bit of time to talk about uh, how our infrastructure has changed over the past couple of years, um, <clears throat> and then highlight some items in the proposed budget to provide a bit more context. The opening of our uh, new middle high school and the technology infusion that came with it created new opportunities to improve the district uh, technology at all of our schools. New Chromebook, laptop, and iPad carts for grades uh, 6 through 9, along with one-to-one -one Chromebooks for grades 10 through 12, uh, allowed us to redeploy existing devices from the old LHS to the primary and elementary schools. Uh, and just some numbers to put that in perspective. In fiscal year 2016, the student-to-device ratio at the primary school was 5.3 to 1, so 5.3 students for every device to use. It's now 2.4 to 1. The ratio at Turkey Hill, then middle school, was 4 to 1. It's now 1.3 to 1. And the student-to-device ratio at the Old Lindenberg High was 3.75 to 1. At LMHS here, it's now 1.2 to 1. Uh, overall, the district has gone from a student-to-device ratio of 4.2 to 1 to 1.4 to 1. It's a huge increase in the number of devices over the past couple of years. Some of these improvements are also due to generous donations from individuals uh, and organizations such as the PTO. Uh, for instance, last year they donated $5,000 to, to the elementary school for devices as well. Um, <clears throat> this past school year was also our first year managing a one to one deployment here in the middle high school for grades 10 through 12. Uh, we distributed over 350 devices. Uh, individually to each student over the course of just a couple of days with minimal interruption to class time. Uh, when collecting devices back from graduating seniors, we had anticipated some level of refurbishment or at least cleaning, uh, but in almost all cases we found that the devices were well cared for, <coughs> excuse me, well cared for and in a condition ready to be redeployed to the 10th grade class. Uh, we did have a few mishaps, mostly covered by insurance, uh, but overall I think the first year one-to-one -one was extremely successful. Are there any questions to this point on my update? So I'll move on to the uh, recommended budget, my proposed budget for FY19. Uh, most of the lines in my FY19 budget request remain unchanged uh, or changed very little. However, there are two lines I'd like to uh, highlight just to provide a little context. First is the, uh, the top line, Administrative Technology Contracted Services. Uh, in my original submission, you might see a, a discrepancy because there's two different um, budgets here. Pearson Education accounted for about a $10,000 increase in this line. Uh, I realized they made a mistake in that, uh, and I reduced that line by that $10,000. And now this line is only about $100 more than it was last year, so there really is no significant change. Oh, so it's 48? It's 49. 49. Yes, 49. Number here. It's <coughs> 48, 949. So that's the very first slide, correct? Yes. 48,949. Yes, under uh, Administrative Technology Contract. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and I did want to discuss one new uh, item in this budget line, which is Archive Social. Uh, we just actually talked about it recently. Uh, with the increased use of social media by teachers and administrators, we can no longer rely on the social media sites themselves to archive our content in such a way that meets state requirements. Uh, Archive Social is a company that specializes in archiving social media posts. They archive Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, any major social media player. Uh, the town also uses social media. I manage the town technology as well. Uh, so we're going to split this cost between the town and the schools. Um, the schools obviously use quite a bit more. So I think the, the split we're going to do this year is 3500 by the schools and 1300 by the town. And we can revisit that uh, next year when we have a little better idea of what kind of volume each side does. Any questions on that stuff? I'm not seeing that. Where's, where is that? Yeah, we don't have that. I don't have that. Uh, you may not have the full detail of the, the budget. Oh, OK. Uh, there, there's okay. some backup sheets that okay. go along with All right, no, that's fine. I was okay. like, oh. Okay. I'm trying to figure out where, where, where it fits. Under, yeah, it's under technology, uh, administrative technology contracted services. A lot oh, of okay. just talking so about it. Oh, it's part of it. OK, that, yes. all right, thank you. OK. Uh, lastly, I wanted to talk about uh, the computers purchase and lease. It's the, I believe, second to the last line. It's highlighted in purple. 
Yes. Uh, I'll get to the reason for that. I broke that out. Um, it'll, I'll explain it. Okay. Uh, it's a major change from prior prior years, and uh, the reason for that is twofold. First, prior to uh, FY18, most large hardware purchases fell into the capital improvement plan, uh, and not in the operating budget. Each year, I would submit requests, sometimes varying ten to twenty thousand dollars depending on needs, uh, and requests from each school. So last year, the capital planning committee came to me uh, and told me they decided to put these requests in uh, my operating budget, both on the town and school side. So in FY17, the middle high school project brought hundreds of new computers to the district, and that actually delayed our need to make any big purchases last year because of all the redeployments I discussed yep. earlier. Uh, so this year, our need to regularly replace outdated equipment is caught back up to us. So that's why that line again is back up a little bit. So the combination of these two factors uh, results in a, a significant increase in the operating budget, but as you can see from the breakout on the bottom, Excluding these items shows that the, the increase from prior years is actually minimal. It's just the capital items that really make that line go. Yeah, okay, yeah. So I've also included two additional options for expanding one-to-one -one as requested by Mr. Santry and Superintendent Collins. Uh, I've also included projected costs. You may not actually have those projections. No. I'm not sure if those are included mm -hmm. in there. Okay. We have grades 9 through 12 and so yes. we have them yes. as option have one, two, and three yes. level service. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, <clears throat> so our ability to repurpose some currently owned technology carts would partially defray the costs in the first year. Um, grades 6, 7, and 8, and 9 all have technology carts that they use. We can actually break those carts down and use those devices right. for okay. the one-to-one -one implementation. Yeah. So for year one, that would bring the cost down. But okay. For years beyond that, right. uh, if we expand it down to 9 through 12, we'd have to buy one set of devices for grade 9 each year. And if we expanded it down to 7 through 12, we would do a three-year rotation instead and buy us a whole set of devices for the seventh grade and then a whole set of devices for the tenth grade each year. Okay. So that's where those costs come from. And those are the major changes, and that's all I had, and I'll be happy to take questions. Mr. Maladrinos, could you talk, because one of the things that we discussed when the request was for additional technology at the middle school, um, it came in the form of additional car carts to basically be adding a cart um, to every classroom, yes. I believe. And that's Very where great. we said, what does it look like if you do one to work one versus doing mobile carts? That's correct. Yeah, if we were to actually purchase one more cart for yeah. each grade level, yeah. we would get so close to one to one that it almost doesn't make sense to do that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Sandry's original request was just uh, one cart, or he said, "Oh, more if you could do it, three carts would be great." Uh, and when you look at the numbers, we would be at something like 85 percent of the way to one to one. Mm -hmm. And it almost makes more sense to just say, "Well, let's just go all in, and we'll figure out a way to sustain this going forward." Right. Which brings us to what we're currently working on and we don't have a, a final is looking at uh, the sustainability of the one-on-one, -on -one, just as we did when we did the initial one-on-one -on -one project. Um, and knowing that this building coming online brought a lot of devices, but all at the same time, which means they start to wear out and need to be replaced all at the same time. Uh, now, um, I know Mr. Maladrinos and his um, great staff, uh, small but mighty, definitely, um, you know, are working on how to extend the life of as many devices as long as possible uh, and yet keep things rolling along well. So Mr. Maladrinos is right now working on very complex spreadsheets for us uh, to show what this replacement plan um, looks like um, to help us really talk about the sustainability of this and how to do the timing around keeping our already identified rotations in place. Uh, for example, teachers uh, work laptops get replaced every four years. We do a school every yep. year, yep. Um, so those laptops are, are refreshed on a four year, uh, every four year basis. Um, so Mr. Maladrinos is working diligently on that, um, and that will 
further inform my recommendation about a month from now in terms of um, what we're moving forward in, in, in terms of the final. Mr. Uh, Spadafino and um, the high school faculty as well as many of the students um, have um, uh, for about a, a year now lobbied hard for a 9 through 12 implementation as opposed to a um, 10 through 12. Have we determined um, the three-year rotation is still what we'd look at for the Chromebooks though? So if we move to 9 through 12, we would do it on a four-year rotation. It would be a four-year rotation. Yes. The prices are slightly different just because if we keep them for four years, I would probably choose a slightly higher-end model just to give it a little more horsepower to last through that time frame. Uh, if yeah. we do a three-year rotation, um, in other words, going down to seventh grade, right. uh, we could do some lower-end devices because it would be out of circulation after three years. Right. So those are the various yeah. replacement models mm -hmm. um, that that he's working through right now. And there are some projections. I'm not sure if you've got all the backup on this. Uh, oh, we don't have them no, printed out. No. They receive yeah. them um, okay. yeah. Yeah, digitally. The I know yeah, you I have sent it a refreshed one today that I will send out tonight. Yes. The um, only change on that is that first line that I discussed going down by right. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But all the backup, um, we set the Excel files out to you um, so yeah, you could see each one of those tabs. But we did not print all of those yeah. out. <coughs> There's quite a few pages. Yeah, the last page is a projected projected one to one cost. It shows okay. full scenarios seven through twelve and nine through twelve and costs for those going on five years. So but we haven't built in the rest of the replacements with the mobiles, uh, our carts in that. It, yeah, uh, it takes into that it takes that into account because we basically stop buying carts for right. our great. Mm -hmm. So and replacing Sixth grade would still have carts. Sixth grade would have a couple, yeah. I think they have two carts now. We could actually probably move one down and make three for them. Um, so sixth grade would stay at carts and that would just be seven to twelve. So it wouldn't be the entire middle school. Right. And we received a communication recently from the um, from Desi uh, talking about some potential funds that we might be able to access for Turkey Hill Elementary School because their analysis seemed to indicate that perhaps we could benefit from some additional devices over there. Um, and so we just received that and we'll be looking at that grant to, to find out. I um, yes, I recall what you're talking about now. Okay. I haven't had time to flush that right. out. Right, so. yeah. Uh, but uh, so the state in acknowledging that based upon the data that we've given them and we know that in order to do the assessment last year, we needed to take carts from this building to, pull it to Turkey Hill. Um, and that was um, even with the generous donation not only of the PTO but also um, that anonymous donor that gave an entire, I think 30, uh, it was a, a mobile lab with 30 or 35 devices. Yes. On it. But we did need to take carts mm -hmm. yeah, from here. Because Turkey so. Hill still does not have enough for their grade level to take the MCAT. No, we for we, two grade level we need to address that right. this year. We're working on a solution to that at, at this time. Um, that's why we're interested in seeing what this proposed um, right. grant uh, funding might might be available from the state. But we need to find a solution uh, for that before the uh, before the MCAT time, obviously. And I think that's one of the middle school concerns too in terms of the number of carts is uh, during MCAS assessment time. There's no devices available. Um, maybe Mr. Maladrino, she could talk about some of how yes. the devices need to be configured. Do the restrictions of the testing? They yeah. can't have any internet access. Right. They can't have any autocorrect in Microsoft Word. There's very specific requirements uh, around these tests. So we have to put the Chromebooks into what's called kiosk mode. Mm -hmm. It basically turns them into very dumb machines, and they're pretty much unusable can't, for any can't other Can't they purpose. use an app at the bottom where that just opens, and the only way then you can get to the internet is to shut down your app and get the internet back up, and then you would have locked yourself out of the test and would need a test administrator to get you back in, which would then see that you've now gone into the internet. I'm not sure if that's possible. 
to be honest, um, but the requirements are very strict, and mm -hmm. if the student can access the internet during the test, it's a problem. Whether they have locked themselves out of the test or not, mm -hmm. um, that may actually violate the testing requirements. Because there, there are some tests that, um, uh, the, um, the WIDA the screener that the ELL department uses, when you go into that, you use an app at the bottom of the, Chrome, of the Chromebook. Or yes, we have still an app. Right, and then you can't go anywhere else unless you've shut down this Chromebook. I couldn't get anywhere else if I wanted to on the Chromebook. So there, there might be another way just throwing that out there. Okay, I, I will definitely look into it. Okay. I don't think it's the case because we've looked into this extensively at this okay. point because of the, um, the burden it puts on. Mm -hmm. Uh, the teachers not being able to use those cards. I know, and it's very time consuming for you guys, though, then to have to turn this all into that kiosk yeah. mode and then turn it all back on. That's actually not, it's easier than it used to be, especially okay. with Chromebooks. So Chromebooks make it easier. It's not a huge burden, but it, it is obviously a small burden. Mm -hmm. um, but I think having someone there to, you know, monitor and get kids back into the test if they break out of the test using an app, that would kind of, I'm not sure if that would be a help or a, or a hindrance either. So. Okay. So, you can do that fairly quickly, but uh, you don't do it every day. At no, the, not that quickly. You know, no. you wouldn't do it during the assessment period, really. No. It takes it offline yeah. that entire yeah, period. For that time. entire time. Yeah. Which means no one can use it for anything. Right. 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 They're testing cards until they're testing cards. Yeah. And that could be managed within a one-on-one -on -one environment. The students would just be required to turn in their one on their laptops if that were the environment that we were working in for that period of time. Yes, we can actually manage them. We could just switch their devices into that mode while while they're off campus, or it doesn't really matter. We can make those changes anytime. So the challenge before the testing, we can turn oh, off okay. one-to-one -one device into a testing device. The the challenges with regard to um, the access to technology uh, during the assessment period are not easily resolved by any of these scenarios, no. except a whole bunch more devices right. that might be able to be utilized that aren't being utilized for the assessment period. So there's really no easy or inexpensive way through right. that dilemma. And a one-on-one -on -one doesn't resolve that. It, a one-on-one -on -one doesn't resolve that. It doesn't, no. Oh, or does it? Because if you have just one class under assessment, then all the other classes have their That's devices. That's true. It would ease it a bit. That one class would have basically brick devices um, while they're in the testing period. Where with our current level at the middle school, when we do assessment, all the devices are being used parts. and labs for and each else. grade level. Okay. And there are no <coughs> devices remaining for the other grade level at okay. any time. Okay. Sorry, I needed to walk through yeah. that. Yes, okay. So we only have six cards here. Right. I just, I'm just i trying to understand if we're looking at, are we, are you making a recommendation about one of these? Are we making a decision about oh, one no. of these? Oh, no. Okay. No. All right. Okay. No. Just we're just, just preliminary. Okay. That's what we're saying. We need to, uh, this is all about sustainability. Right. And we worked hard around this for the first one-on-one -on -one for the uh, 10 through 12. Yeah to get to the sustainability. So we didn't really need to dig into this and, and have a plan, because it does nobody any good for us to um, bring in a bunch of new devices, but three or four years from now not be able to replace them. Replace them. That doesn't really solve the problem no. at all. So more to come on that, but here's what it looks like in terms of the initial costs to do that. Does anybody have any questions further? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Longester. He's got the longest. I know, we really. Just built these up that? three lines. To, you know, <laughs> next time you have to start with the longest. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Good evening. 
So, uh, I'm going to talk about generally about what what we're experiencing uh, with uh, this budget, and so with some of the factors that are driving it. So, uh, we with a new school coming online, uh, we've got one year worth of data. That so we're starting to, to flush out the uh, historical operating costs on the building. Uh, and so we had that one year FY17, uh, although there, there are some outliers that were happened in FY17 uh, that influenced our costs in FY17. So, and uh, things that are happening this year that, look, that are additional to what happened in FY17. So specifically, uh, we had some costs associated with Lunar, the old Lunenburg High School as we wrap things up that, that hit in, into FY18 specifically around water use and uh, sewer use as the old building was still up and still being in service uh, prior to its demolition. And then uh, and so there's some costs of those wound up in FY, uh, FY17. And then uh, this year, of course, we we're getting things that we didn't have last year, uh, such as the athletic, all the athletic fields online, all the sports lighting online. So there's a few things that they're influencing this budget that uh, we didn't really collect historical data on in FY17. That being said, I, I, you know, we're continuing to refine this and I think we're getting closer to what the true uh, you know, long-term costs should be year after year as we get, get better and better and more accurate data. Uh, so on this budget, uh, you know, it's a, an overall reduction of $10,776 uh, in the proposal. Uh, and there are a couple major things that happened that I would like to highlight. There's about eight items that I think I want to call your attention to on the uh, on the on this spreadsheet. So the very first one would be is the uh, under heating of buildings, the natural gas heating uh, charges. Uh, if you look at our FY17 costs, uh, you know we we uh, expended eighty-four thousand five hundred and sixteen dollars, which uh, you know, from FY16 is a substantial reduction, and that obviously reflects the new building coming down the line, the high school, the old high school being demolished. Uh, in the FY19, so I'm projecting a reduction down to uh, 102,655, and uh, and I would say that it potentially could our actual expenditure could be lower. So I am carrying a 10% contingency in that line, which is around $9,332. Uh, so that represents uh, you know, some, some uh, protection against a particularly uh, cold winter uh, in, F in FY19. But that, that is in there, so uh, you know, we can, I think we're going to we'll continue to see where that shakes out over time. But, uh, I think we're getting close to where it truly is going to be. <coughs> the second one I would like to talk about is electricity. So uh, in FY17, we we didn't really get any of the, the big uh, projects online that, were, that we knew were going to cut our costs, which were the, the net meeting agreements, power purchasing agreements. Uh, there were two of those. And we had the rooftop solar that was being installed in this building, and so those uh, those had some effect on cost last year. But uh, like the solar for this building didn't really come online until June, right? And so we didn't really see a lot of savings on that. So we're also showing that as projected downward uh, to 188,000, uh, and you know potentially that might go go lower. Uh, I'm carrying a 5% contingency in that line, which is $8,954. Uh, that's one that, once again, we, we need to kind of see the systems operate because they do link together. Uh, our demand charges on our electric bill are tied to our peak demand uh, during the month. But with the solar on the roof, that should influence that. To how much is hard to say, and when exactly will it be that peak? Uh, I kind of think that you know it should probably be during the during the school day, roughly around nine o'clock in the morning, when the kitchen's in, in full service, all the lights are probably on, most of the devices are running, all the ventilation is running. Uh, that's when I believe it will be, and and that will we'll be getting that data over time. Um, 
you know, the other the other time when we start pushing a lot of electricity is when we have three sports fields with all the sports lighting at the same time. So those are the two the two possibles. But I kind of suspect it's going to be the morning. Uh, the solar could potentially influence that. At nine o'clock in the morning, it is starting to generate electricity, so it could be starting to work on on reducing that demand to a certain level. So. Uh, so we, we won't really have that information as until we get through the next year. Uh, but we know it should be lower, and uh, we'll have, obviously, a much better data point next year at this time. Uh, the third one I want to talk about was water consumption. Uh, once again, that's another reduction, uh, uh, taking that down to 21,200. Uh, and that was based upon uh, looking at what we've projected in this year's budget was based upon three athletic fields being online. Of course, they are online. We had water restrictions this year. We were running a new irrigation system. And uh, so coming through that, uh, I think we've got, we have a surplus in this year's budget because I think we're going to use about $10,000 for irrigation for all three fields. And we projected that 18000 so, so that's why you're seeing that reduction of 8,450. Is that I think that you know that we're over this year we have surplus this year in that budget line, uh, and uh, with the water restriction and the, the new irrigation system, uh, we did just didn't use as much water and, and didn't need to. So that's another projected reduction. Uh, the next one I wanted to talk about was maintenance of grounds, contracted services. Uh, so a couple things on that. The, the major piece on that is we're, we are looking at pulling the any contracted grounds care for fields out of the operating budget and shifting it into facilities use funding with the idea that uh, the uh, funds that are, were good will be received from uh, Lunenburg Youth Soccer for use of athletic fields. They're going to be on the, on the grass field and that's where they want to be. They have two payments that they will make to the, to the school district. And so we think those ought to go into the uh, school facilities use and be used directly for the care of the field. So, so and then the other, so that's roughly around six, 16, 17,000. And then the uh, other part was that when we actually bid the work for the three fields, it came in some ten, almost 10,000 under what we had projected. Uh, so there were some additional savings there. So that's why we reduced that, recommending reduce that line to 10,800. Uh, fifth one I want to talk about just is maintenance of building contracts. So that, it's a, that's a $2,000 increase. And you know one of the things we're experiencing at, you know, in the operation of this building is just is that there are many, many systems that are very, very complicated and all linked together. Uh, you know, particularly with things like having ele you know, elevators with, that are linked with fire alarm systems uh, into building controls. All of these connections, uh, you know, have potential to have some very expensive repairs. So while I'm not projecting a large increase, it's just something I'm, I'm very uh, tuned to. Uh, we have seen a few repairs this year that were, were relatively on the expensive side. They weren't necessarily just here either at the middle school, high school. We had one of the Turkey Hill that was almost $4,000 for a stair lift. So there, are, there can be some very expensive repairs. And so I said, I looked at that more than just hedging, hedging bets that you know, we're going to see uh, you know, some expensive repairs. Our, our, the general philosophy I have on the contracted services is that the contracted services are there for, to do one of a couple different things. Either one, to, to bring the expertise that we don't have in-house with our own maintenance personnel, uh, to work on those things that we have no business working on, such as elevators and fire alarm systems. And then uh, secondly is, is, is occasionally it will be, uh, you know, to, uh, to uh, ease a time crunch. If our maintenance folks are fully engaged in something and we need to get something done, that might be a time when we we'll call in contract labor. But for the most part, the overall philosophy is to try to keep the amount of contract labor down and to, to use our own maintenance personnel to the maximum extent we can uh, as efficiently as possible. Um, 
The sixth one I want to talk about was emer emergency expenditures. Once again, this is one of those areas that, you know, we hope ne never to have to use it. Occasionally we do use it, and uh, we haven't used it extensively uh, to its full extent too many times. Uh, but occasionally you will find that we will get a really expensive repair. Uh, the most expensive repair I think that I've experienced over the last uh, 15 years was when the Plasios Elementary School lost its power power feed from the street and over a February weekend we had to have power restored to the building and that was I think nearly ten to twelve thousand dollars some of it was well I think there wasn't I don't think too much was covered by the insurance I think we pretty much covered all of it but anyway so I'm recommending that, that we increase the what we have in the emergency expenditures by an additional twenty five hundred and have that at seven thousand five hundred. Uh, the seventh thing I want to talk about, which is new equipment. Uh, new equipment uh, is the, the things that were projected for uh, FY19 were two things. One, uh, an additional utility trailer uh, for the maintenance team. Uh, that will allow us to be able to move uh, any, either one of our tractors to, to another site, like a primary school. You know, I, I always have this vision of, you know, of a breakdown of a tractor and, and we need to get another heavy piece of equipment such as a snow, thrower, snow uh, tractor down to the primary school and, and we're not driving it down Mass Avenue. So, so I think this is just uh, for, for less than $2,000 it will give us the ability to move equipment around uh, and uh, to do it safely. And, uh, and, and give us that flexibility that if we needed something or we needed two pieces of equipment, we could get them both there uh, to do what needs to be done. And then the last one, one I want to talk about is the capital improvement line. This is this was a kind of a major change, and I just wanted to really focus in on that. So capital improvement, uh, you know, showing that at sixty thousand. Uh, so there's a, a variety of things in here. Uh, most noteworthy is. Uh, this is where we put in the $40,000 uh, turf field replacement uh, payment. So we're reflecting it in here, uh, and, it's, and that is new. Uh, and then beyond that, and uh, beyond that, I had four other items that I was carrying in uh, capital improvement, and, and I'll, go, I'll brief those in order. Uh, some of you will be familiar with. Uh, the second one was going to be for the primary school would be a shade structure. It would be five thousand for a shade structure. It would be then be installed by school maintenance personnel uh, and, and get us a you know, shade structure down there for, for those folks that need that. The third item I included was some site furnishings for the primary school, and uh, namely that was going to be uh, some picnic tables, some heavy duty picnic tables on the are similar to what we bought for Lunarburg Middle High School out there. The ones that are out off the cafeteria is kind of what I had in mind. Um, the, the fourth item was a shade structure for Turkey Hill Elementary School. Once again, another 5,000 also to be installed by school maintenance personnel. And then finally, uh, the fifth one would be site furnishings for Turkey Hill Elementary School. And that would be, once again, more Picking tables of the same variety that we're talking about for the primary school that are here, and also some uh, some uh, benches for the playground. Right now, the playground there doesn't have anything. Yeah, yeah. So we kind of need that to just for the parents. The parents, if they with kids, they can play that. There's like one. Right. We we have a set of old old, old bleachers, but we kind of like to take kind of move that to a location where those could be better used than, yeah. than on the playground. Yeah. So those are so those are the. Uh, you know, that's the items that I wanted to brief. Um, once again, I think this is a budget that continues to evolve. Uh, and, you know, having the historical data is, helps us kind of get make sure that we've got this thing right. Um, like I said, I think it has the potential to go lower. But uh, I think this is a, a very conservative budget nonetheless. Um, so that $40,000 turf field payment is an actual money that's sitting there for capital? 
it's going to be used for the turf game, right? It's gone. Right. It's just there sitting. We've been the showing whole. that before in the athletic budget. I think we yeah. used to carry like 25 there. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. um, the 40K, uh, um, given how the the funds from Weiser are flowing, yeah. um, where the Bengals are making a payment directly to the town hall Correct. against that yeah. bond, that's how we set up their yeah. agreement to do it that way, but that's not the way license agreement is, and so with those funds coming into that facilities account and, and being spent then on the um, contracted uh, maintenance, which is the mowing every week as well as fertilization. Um, it made sense to have the money that's going out in the same, un under the same category um, of Mr. Monda's budget rather than have the 40K over in athletics where right. Right. it's the money coming in is coming in here. So it just um, seemed function wise to be the appropriate line to put that payment. So we as well for DESE accounting. Okay, so we keep the money from LIFA. Yes. But we send our money out. This 40K, yes. Okay. Yes, we'll make a 40K. This is the line that we'll transfer to the town okay. 40K uh, of funds for to make that payment okay. every year. Got it. And then the other 20k is related to the it's shade the structures. The, the capital. We, we were listening, Mrs. Ailes. Mm -hmm. uh, I know. I, know. Yeah. I appreciate it. I wrote it all I'm down. I'm very excited. I was, gonna look, I was looking yeah. to see because yeah. you were the one that yeah. said you want like at the other schools. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. And I'm excited because I think that those. I mean, the picnic tables are fantastic, yeah. but I'm really excited about the shade structure, especially at the primary school. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also like to day. <laughs> I'd also like to give you a quick update on uh, capital improvements uh, uh, for that were, that were funded out of FY17. So we had two projects that uh, we funded out of budget. Uh, the camera project for Turkey Hill Elementary School and uh, a uh, camera and door access system for Lunenburg Primary School. Those projects are continuing along. They're, they're about, uh, I would say, 75 to 80 percent complete. Uh, we are still uh, waiting for the vendor to finish uh, the install of the door access system at Lunenburg Primary School. Uh, and then we'll need to do uh, load software on uh, several computers and then do training with the staff. Uh, we expect that project will wrap up here in December. Uh, and uh, I, I don't have an exact date, but we're kind of expecting that sometime within the next week or so we'll have a contractor back on site to get that door access system installed. What is the time frame for the software and the training for the staff? Uh, we haven't selected dates, but I would expect it would probably be early, early to mid-December. Uh, the, the door access system is the same software that, that is the camera system all okay. linked together. And uh, so I don't expect that we'll see any of that training take place until all the installation is complete. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Do you have any questions? No? No. Very, very thorough, thorough and the, the spreadsheets were very thorough and yes. easy to understand. Yes, very thorough. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. On that note, for the committee, would you prefer to have that entire packet printed out? Would you like to have that available going forward with well, the other budget up. or having it electronically? I prefer it. It's, it's, one, thing to, it's one thing to have it there, but you want to have it here. Right. So I would prefer it. Then also if I do not, then it seems to get home with me and it goes into my notes that way and then sure. I don't have to put it on from a selfish standpoint, um, so I uh, um, uh, some folks like to work off their electronics. Right. Other uh, folks a hard copy, and, and I, you know, I tend to be more of a hard copy person. I right. know. Okay. Uh, so get there. If you've got to reflect back, good luck going through electronically to find it. You know, you've got to you've got to think about what were the dates on that, what were where it's easier to follow yep. through. So I'm happy to provide that. Uh, if you don't need it, um, 
you know, I won't provide it, but if you would like a hard copy, then I'll, I'll make sure you have a hard copy. I mean, so I hear at least one. Yeah. Two? I, I was able to follow through on my device. Okay. So are you is it just by one? I want it. That's four of us. Four or five copies. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm the odd man now. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna aim to aim for that. I apologize. I was trying to get back last week. I know, like like the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of us. Yeah, I okay. Yep, yep. That's why I need to. Okay, I will do that. All right. Oh, we're on to public comments. <laughs> Does, do I have public co a comment from the public? <laughs> Great <Any> job. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. Um, any public wish. comments from the rest of the board? Mm -hmm. No? Okay. Do we have any reports? Uh, no. Uh, well, Athletic Advisory, we're meeting on the 27th at 7 p.m. in this room. Okay. Any school council? High school met this yesterday. A um, couple of things that were, were mentioned next Wednesday, the 22nd of November, they'll be having um, some honor awards for the students. Honor roll will be um, celebrated with the students. Abigail Adams Awards will be presented, and we have a merit scholar that will be awarded at that time as well. So that'll be an exciting time for the students. Um, also at the high school, they're beginning the accreditation process. Uh, there have been some changes. We're now at a three-year process. The first year, which is the one that we're starting to enter, is a period of self-reflection where the high school will think about what is working well for them, areas that they're going to need to improve on. So there are some changes to how the accreditation process works, but it looks like it's more friendly to the, the population, to the, the staff, that they can really take ownership of what they're doing well and what they feel they need to make improvements on. So that's the year that they're in for that. Um, Turkey Hill had a meeting yesterday, but I was unable to attend. But Mrs. Okerman, were you there? No, I was you were not able to attend. You were teaching a course last night. Okay. Well, I'll have to get the notes from someone else. And there were no others? Middle school didn't run, not me. Okay. Yeah. And um, primary is the 29th. 29th. Okay. And the policy subcommittee did meet. PTO. PTO. Also oh, PTO. PTO sorry. PTO, PTO, okay. met. That's right. PTO, PTO met did. on Monday. They received updates from the principals. The members that were there really appreciate the principals coming out and being able to speak face to face and giving some updates on what's going on at the different campuses. At the primary school, I'd like to highlight the, the veterans program. They were able to have 50 veterans wow. and had a really beautiful program with music. So they highlighted that at the elementary school. They were talking about the Girls on the Run program yeah. that's happening at this time. At the middle school, the sixth graders are getting to participate in Fridays in December. They're going to have Taekwondo and Fridays in the, in the gym so parents can uh, let their students participate in Taekwondo. It'll be a nice time for those guys. And at the high school, uh, like I mentioned, the Academic Achievement Rally. Oh, and also Barnes & Nobles is going on right now. If you are not able to make it, you can use Barnes & Nobles code 12232872 and do your online purchases at bn.com backslash bookfairs. And that is until November 21st. Okay. So you can use that code, that website, and still participate and have support the PTO and get some great books for the holidays, perhaps. Everything in the, st in the, everything in the store. Yeah, yeah. everything. <laughs> Including the cheesecakes. Cheesecakes. <laughs> 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 I remember, hey, there's lots of those cheesecakes. Do they mail them? Do they mail them? I think they yeah. do. I think they, they ship them. They ship them. Yeah, the cheesecake factory cheesecakes. Yeah, I don't know. They're frozen, too. They probably do ship them. I think they do. They might. So the next meeting for the PTO is December 11th, and we really look forward to more members coming out and being at the PTO meetings. That's it for me. That's it for you. Okay, sorry. The policy subcommittee we met last Thursday, correct? We did. We did. We did, and we just started working on policy, on the policies that we talked about. We don't have anything to present to you because we didn't do anything in hard writing. 
or update anything yet. Um, we have another meeting on the 27th. Yeah. Down the hall from here. Okay. Same day as the athletic advisory. <laughs> Stuff Monday. <laughs> Same Monday, yeah. And wellness did mean just really right. quickly. Um, the the entire meeting was focused on um, a presentation um, with the possibility of looking at a, a collaborative effort within the town to bring in a referral service regarding mental health. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So there were lots of community members and members from um, other entities within town. We had several school um, counselors, nurses. Yes, was uh, there was a, a, a very large group. What yeah. was the final count? Um, I don't remember the exact yeah. final count. So I'm not sure everybody signed in. But 20, right? I was just going to say, my guess is 20 people. It was a great. Um, yeah, it was great. Yeah. It was great. Um, do we have any topics for future discussion? Let's just leave it in the budget season. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Topics for future discussion. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll take a motion for adjournment. Motion yeah. to adjourn at 8.51 p.m. I don't think we're going to make it to I'll I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I don't think we're going to make it to Barnes & Noble.